All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm Rich Folley. You're watching PBS Books coverage of AWP 2018. Our coverage is brought to you by PBS's The Great American Read series, which launches this spring, will happen all fall. It's an incredible series. You're going to hear lots more about it coming soon. And I'm happy right now to be sitting with Marcus Wicker, who is the author of this incredible collection of poems, Silencer. Welcome, yeah. Marcus. Thanks, good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. You know, the, the title itself is where we should start. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea of being silenced or finding a way to talk about issues is where this all originates. Right. Silencer is uh, a word I believe you came up with or a concept you came up with mm -hmm. to start infusing some of the heavier subject matter that was coming up in your conversations every day in a way that people could sort of digest. Can you explain right. that a little bit? Sure. I was living in Southern Indiana. I was teaching at a little school there and I had a group of friends. We'd go out for dinner a couple of times a month and we'd talk about everything under the sun because we were a pretty eclectic group of people. But whenever I brought up gun violence, it always got eerily silent. And when I was in those exchanges, I sort of felt like I was being silenced. And so I did the passive aggressive thing that you do as a writer. Instead of talking to them directly, I started to write these poems about gun violence. And instead of those details that you expect to see in the news that you get so desensitized to, all the, the gore and the graphic violence, I talk about gun violence without talking about gun violence. And so it's my hope that the absence of detail, those will be the things that are willing to stir a reader and move them to action. Yeah, no, it served as a bridge for you, obviously, to be able to write about it, talk about it. That's right. But, but is there resentment that you had to find this sort of end around approach to discussing something as, as powerful, as devastating, as difficult as gun violence? Maybe a little, but more than anything else, I mean, poetry is about catharsis for me. Sometimes I don't know exactly what's on my mind or my heart until I work it out on the page. It's almost like I'm solving for X. And so in a way it was like those friends did me a favor and these poems did me a favor in terms of therapy. Talk more about, if you don't mind, the silencer idea. Some of the people that you wrote about there's Eric Garner and some of the other acts of violence that were happening when you wrote this book. Yeah. Uh, how do you not talk about the violence when you're talking about the violence? Sure, sure. I think that there's a way to use some of the images from the news. Like if you're talking about Trayvon Martin, you can reference the Skittles, right? Um, you can reference a park, you can reference a specific gun, right? And so there are certainly markers and signposts that are used, but more than anything, I'm using the backdrop of history um, and the landscape to make you think about the peculiar institution in concert with some of these things politically that come up over and over again for African Americans. Yeah, there are these, these, these markers, right? I mean, Claudia Rankin's book, Citizen, the cover is just a hoodie right. uh, that, that became symbolic of something much bigger. Right. Um, and that's all you needed to put. Just that, that image alone speaks to something really powerful. That's right. And she used that very effectively as well. Uh-huh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you also though use, um, you're, you're a pop culture person, you're a music person, whether it's the Roots or Kendrick Lamar or all these right. other people that make their way uh, into, your, uh, into your poems. Yeah. How does music and syncopation of music come into play when you're writing and thinking about poetry? Well, I guess I can't divorce myself from music, you know? I'm a child of early 90s hip hop, so folks like Wu-Tang, A Tribe Called Quest, I'm always listening to them. Um, before I write, I listen to music. And so often it happens that I sit down at my desk and I've got like the rhythm of something that was in my headphones in my head, and I'll sit down and I'll write, and the poems will come out in those cadences. So it actually is it's sort of like a, it's a, like a lubricant, it's a grease, it's for you that like it helps this stuff kind of come out of your head. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's like I'm working out an earworm sometimes, right? A song that gets stuck in your head, sometimes the only way for me to get it out is to write it out of me. Yeah, yeah do you think that, um, that, 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 that those early days of hip hop, which is now sort of celebrated with fear of a black planet, planet with like public enemy and some of the other yeah. things that you reference, um, are now considered classics. Do you think that they are recognized for the sort of works of poetry that they are now as you look back at them? I hope so, I hope so. I think that actually the more mumble rappers we listen to, like these terrible folks that are on the air now, perhaps we'll go back through the archives and we'll appreciate them even more, not just for their music and their politics, but for their ear, right? Um, the way that they deal with cadences, with slant rhyme, um, with literary devices, they're certainly poets. Yeah, so you also saw, certainly at the time, that era of hip-hop that you're talking about, a very political element, and mm -hmm. it's still there. 
Yeah. Uh, of course, it's still there, and it's very strong. But it seems like it was very overt. Uh, it was very, uh, especially with people like Public Enemy, but others too. Right. At that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but now, if you, you, you know, a lot of your poems are are actual, sort of, um, are serious. They're sil these these silencers, as you call them. <laughs> Some of them are more lighthearted, even fun, yeah. um, where you're either playfully calling out something, or you're you're thinking about. Uh, you know, some of the, those elements, the pop culture elements that you loved. Right. How do you mix those two things in when you're putting a book like this together? How long does it take to think about that sort of poem, the poem cadence? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I'm always revising, right? It's like I'll write a thing and hopefully I can sit down and get something out in one sitting, but then I might have to tuck it in a drawer for three months or for a year. And then ideas of pop culture will work themselves into the pages or ideas of politics, but they're never married at once. It's always about time and space for me. Yeah. And you're, now you're, you're teaching. I am. Um, in all the places we talked about, there's Southern Indiana and Michigan where you lived and grew up in near Ann Arbor. Yeah. Um, now in Memphis where you're in the, are you teaching the MFA program there. I do. Um, you're around other writers, you're around other people and, and you're able to sort of communicate these things. It was outside of that writing community though where you really felt you needed to find a way to talk about some of these really important serious issues that were right. affecting you that you're thinking about. As you think about like that sort of white black world, that sort of racial divide when it comes to these topics, how do we, how do we figure that out, right? You, you found this sort of end around for you. You said it's a catharsis, but Sometimes you want to conk people on the head with something and sort of maybe have a wake up moment. Yeah. Um, you seem to have found a way to sort of bridge that gap. H how do we do it so that people all want to pay attention and want to hear and empathize with some of the things you're writing about? Yeah, I think I recognize that it's hard for certain folks to read literature that's about politics, that's about race, that's about inequity. One of the ways that I do, it, and I think that's effective, is through the use of humor, right? Sometimes I'll open up a poem with a joke as an olive branch or a smoke screen, invite everyone into the poem, and then you get a few stanzas in and you really feel or you really understand the dramatic situation of the poem. Um, that's the way for me and my work. Maybe you could read one for us. We, we talked earlier about, this is a pretty good example of that actually, um, a poem called In Defense of Ballin' on a Budget. Yeah. Maybe sure. you wouldn't mind reading that for us. Absolutely. So there's an epigraph from Will Smith. Too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't like. In Defense of Ballin' on a Budget. Damn, Will. They got you sounding mighty Uncle Phil in these streets. Like the still calling the kettle one cheap, how where we started from is never done with our undoing. To get the job, always stay starched, creased to death, fresher than the interviewer. Stop acting brand new, like you aren't Slick Rick the ruler of this particular Jim Crow era. Like you didn't whip a lease Jeep in 89. Nigga, please. The Maybox in your blind spot. Go back to that playground in middle-class West Philly when you were kicking silly rhymes trying to king yourself. When rocking a jiggy blazer paisley with a snapback seemed like fun. To impress upon the self, I'm someone. That's great. Thanks. Can you talk about, first of all, a little Fresh Prince uh, huh? call out there, certainly. But can you talk about what prompted you to write that and, and what you're asking Will Smith and other people like Will Smith in that poem to consider. Yeah, well, I mean, it's from this interview that he did in the early 90s. And in this very insidious way, he's talking about black people. He's talking about African-Americans and the way that we spend money. But I think that there's more to it than that, right? Um, there is uh, a history of inequity and there's a reason why we deal with money in the way that we do. And so I'm asking Will Smith to actually think about his place, right? Um, the way that he was a symbol for sort of gaudy success markers in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, for instance. Yeah. yeah, to revisit and to remind themselves of, of those earlier days, maybe, yeah. Right, when he used to have rims, right, <laughs> on his Jeep. Absolutely, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah, let's talk about the cover a little bit uh, of yeah. this book. One of the things I love so much about the cover of Silencer, it's a very powerful cover, yeah. uh, uh, and you have this, businessman in a crisp suit, nice tie, 
and hair that is so unruly that it cannot be contained by the cover yeah. of this book. And that sort of dichotomy really struck me as I was looking at it. What was it about this image? And did you have it brought in for this book specifically, or where did you find it? I was first introduced to Kikindi Wiley's book, um, or his work rather, in Detroit. I was teaching in the Detroit Public Schools, and like in the middle between breaks, I'd go to the DIA, and I saw one of his paintings, uh, a black man on a horse with Timberlands on. And I thought, how arresting is this? And so I started to do my research, and I came across that. It's called Conspicuous Fraud, Eminence. The poems in the book, some of them use formal approaches. There are sonnets and sestinas and huzzles, but there's always a way that I break that form. So it just reminded me a lot of the painting, right? So there's this guy who's got a suit. Um, it's a little loose, right? He's dressed for the business world, but it's got a little play in it. And then there's this hair that's unforgivably black um, and the way that my mechanics are, I think. What was that like for you when you were growing up? Um, you know, obviously you, you talked about being in Southern Indiana, you grew up in Ann Arbor, which is a very uh, racially mixed town. Yeah. Uh, you, you sound and seem comfortable kind of straddling those two worlds. What was it like for you? And how do you think that you've used that to your, in your writing and in your life yeah. going forward? Yeah, I'm very much a product of my environment. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, that's what it says on my bio. I lived in Ann Arbor for a while, but I also lived in Ypsilanti, Michigan, which is 15 minutes away, but it's another world in terms of economics and class. And so when I lived in Ipsy in a very mixed neighborhood, I was still going to private school in Ann Arbor where I was one of two black kids um, in class. And so I got used to speaking the Queen's English and a little slang. I'd listen to my Green Day and Faith Hill and then my Tribe Called Quest and <laughs> Das Effects. And I'm interested in De Glossia, mixing high and low diction, but also high and low culture. That's important to my books. I want them to be read by academics, but also people in my neighborhood who didn't finish high school. Who else does that really well? When you were, when you were becoming influenced by literature and books, um, who did you turn to? Where did you find that sort of mix that you're talking about? Yeah, well, I've always liked uh, Yusuf Komanyaka, for one. He's a guy who I think could write in any style. He could, you know, write a sonnet or a prose poem, a narrative, a lyric. And so that was my entryway. Um, also poets like Major Jackson and Terrence Hayes, looking at their work on the page as a young writer made me confident in the idea that I could do the same, that I didn't have to be married to one voice or one approach. I could just sort of be my wild self on the page, whatever that looked like. What was it about poetry? When did that grab you? And when did you realize that there was a world out there that you could turn into a career, teaching poetry, et cetera, yeah. uh, where that this was something that was, it was in your blood, that was who you were? I started when I was in high school, Brave New Voices, before it was called that. Um, there was one of those in Ann Arbor and I had this teacher who took us there and I saw these kids reading these performance poems that were so brave and I'd only written in my journal I'd never shared with anyone else. And so I took a summer poetry workshop um, that year and I just kept writing. I kept writing through college and I was a public law major but I was always pinning these poems in my con law books. And so when I finished, I got into a couple of law schools and I was headed that route but I just couldn't do it. It was more for my mother than me, you know? And so I took a year off and I wrote ad copy, but I kept writing poems and I had a couple of mentors who said, if you want, I'll support you if you want to send to MFA programs. And then it just snowballed. So it happened on accident, really. And then you found your way to people like Ross Gay, who you said was one of your teachers and, yeah. and other people that influence you. you. You talk about penning and writing poems and you talk about performing poems. Right. There's a difference obviously between the two and, and sometimes people don't perform their poems you do, yeah. you just did for us. I think that's really interesting. What, what is the difference for you and do you think that there is a separation at all? I mean, I think that the best poems that sound good on a microphone are just well written on the page anyway. Uh, for me, my favorite poems bridge that gap between page and stage, right? And so they're meditative and there are things that you can think about once you set the book down, but also you're thinking about sounds. I mean, when I write, I'm always reading to myself. I'm talking these poems out. And so I couldn't have a roommate, for instance. I'll say a line over and over and over again until it feels like me, and it would drive a roommate crazy. And I think about um, whatever place I was in when I was writing the poem when I'm on stage. Well, it's an amazing collection, Marcus. Thank and I, I'm really happy that you're here. The book is Silencer. Yeah. It's really powerful. Love the perspective and the angles that you take to, mm. 
bring us deeper into the subject matter. And of course, I love your musical taste too. I'm a 90s guy myself, so okay. great to have you here. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Care.